talk by Reverend John this morning. He always has something intriguing, but he whispered to me that his talk has a particularly intriguing title. And I'm really looking forward with great anticipation to what he's going to say under the title, The Cure for Ungleness. I think it's a word he coined, the cure for ungleness. Reverend John, please explain. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Michael, and uh, good morning, family. And a warm welcome to those who are joining us in consciousness on the World Wide Web and watching us on YouTube. And we send you warm thoughts because it's a balmy Sunday morning here in beautiful Jamaica. And I know some of you are shivering in your boots. <laughs> so, a lawyer and a Jamaican are sitting next to each other on a long flight. The lawyer can't sleep on aircraft. And the Jamaican, having parted till late the night before, wants to catch up on his sleep. The lawyer asks if the Jamaican would like to play a game for money. You know, Jamaican's ears always prick up at that. The Jamaican, though, politely declines, saying, my uncle have $50 upon me, my friend. And then he settles down for a nap. The lawyer senses that his fellow traveler is not as educated as he is, and so persists, explaining that the game is a lot of fun. It's amazing, eh, how many people mistake a lack of education for a lack of intelligence. I know a lot of PhDs who don't have one iota of common sense. And I know a lot of folks who never had the opportunity or the blessing of an education who are absolutely brilliant. But that's a whole other story. So Smarty Pants Lawyer says, and I quote, since you have a cash flow problem, I tell you what, I'll ask you a question, and if you don't know the answer, you pay me only $5. Then you ask me one question, and if I don't, don't know the answer, I'll pay you $500. Naturally, the Jamaican comes wide awake. He catches his attention. Since he's seeking an economic bailout, that's why he's going to the States in the first place. So he agrees to play the game. The lawyer asks the first question. Uh, tell me, what is the distance from the Earth to the moon? Without a word, my Jamaican hero reaches into his pocket, pulls out a $5 bill, and hands it to his fellow traveler. Now it's the Jamaican's turn. He asks the lawyer. So what goes up a hill to the summit with three legs and comes down with four? The lawyer uses his laptop, he searches the net, and even the Library of Congress, he sends emails to all his brilliant friends, and all to no avail. Meanwhile, our Jamaican hero is doing what? He's gone back to his napping. After an hour of searching, our friendly lawyer finally gives up. He wakes the Jamaican and hands him $500. The Jamaican pockets the 500 and goes right back to sleep. The lawyer is going nuts to know the answer to the question, so he wakes the Jamaican again and says, you can't go back to sleep. So what goes up a hill to the summit with three legs and comes down with four? The Jamaican reaches into his pocket, hands the lawyer five dollars, and goes back to sleep. No longer I'm going to have $50. The continuing slide of the Jamaican dollar against the US dollar has many Jamaicans worried about the economy. And indeed, all over the world, financial exports, experts are gloomy, predicting perhaps another recession. But I want you to know that worry about inflation and the high cost of living is not a modern scourge. Over two and a half millennia ago, the prophet Haggai wrote, and I quote, he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. End of quote. It's, that's from Haggai chapter 1 verse 6. Do you feel like that when you go to the supermarket sometimes? Like you put your money in a bag with holes. I've had a whole raft of folks uh, just coming for counseling or just calling me and saying, 
giving me stories about their challenges in the area of prosperity. They feel as though their money is in a bag with holes. And I believe, my friends, it is time for us in truth, in this truth movement, to respond to the times by using the powerful tools we have at our disposal. Our program for November therefore focuses, you will notice, on prosperity and will aim at teaching us how we can use our consciousness of prosperity so that we can thrive individually as well as a community. And I believe if we in individually thrive, everybody thrives, we, it's, it's kind of contagious, the prosperity consciousness. And this is in fact the thrust of our Thriving Ministry Initiative, which is a spiritually based program aimed at teaching everyone who attends this church how to achieve a sense of spiritual and financial well-being. Well-being, by the way, is the original meaning of the word wealth. So I urge you to read the monthly updates from the Thriving Ministry Council, and thank you, Lorna, for this morning's, and to get involved with the program by joining one of the four quadrants, which focus on four important areas, consciousness raising, community, culture, and organization. Just go into your heart and say, which of these calls to me to become involved with? and then you can contact any member of the quadrants. The names are posted on the notice board, and you can also waylay uh, Thriving Ministry Council Chair Lona Phillips, who you just heard from. By the way, she's Ms. Phillips and Mrs. Nicholson, Reverend Michael. <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Nicholson, sit down side of her. So, uncle, make that mistake once. <laughs> and speaking of the original meaning of words, did you know that the word prosperity comes from a Latin root which means to go forward with hope. To prosper is to go forward with hope. Prosperity is therefore really an attitude toward life, a consciousness of being a fully functioning, thriving person in an already abundant universe, experiencing what the beautiful Jesus called the life more abundant. Can we say it together? Mine is the life more abundant. Can we say that? Mine is the life more abundant. I'm not convinced. Mine is the life more yes, now you sound like you're not ongle saying it. <laughs> Eric Butterworth, who authored a book titled Spiritual Economics, which I, which I wish our financial pundits would read and digest, had this to say about prosperity, and I quote, the starting point in realizing prosperity is to accept responsibility for your own thoughts, thus taking charge of your own life. You are not responsible for what is said in the Wall Street Journal or what comes out of Washington in the form of economic indicators, but you are very much responsible for what you think about these things. You cannot afford to let the so-called experts decide how you are going to think and how you are going to feel. For how you think and feel about the economy in general and your financial affairs in particular will unvaryingly determine what you experience. End of that quote from Butterworth. In other words, my friends, it is done unto you as you believe. It is for this reason that we need to refrain from referring to the economy as declining and to avoid conversations about the high cost of living. Instead, form the habit of thinking and talking about things you want to see more of in your life. Butterworth recommends that we give ourselves occasional consciousness boosters such as, and I quote, God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. Let's say that together. God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. Recently, I have been affirming, and I quote this, I work for God. God is my CEO and my paymaster. Don't you like the idea that all of us have only one employer? We all work at different branches of the same company, God Inc. Think of it. If God is your employer, then you can never be underpaid. You are always in line for a raise, and you need never be worried about what the funds, where the funds are coming from to maintain you. A few years ago, I coined the word that Reverend Michael referred to from the way we pronounce the word only in Jamaica. 
The Jamaican word for only is uncle. So I spell it O-N-G-L-E. For example, we say, may uncle have a hundred dollars. So, ungleness is a very insidious disease which results in the little one has being taken away. That's how the universal law works. When the master teacher said in Mark 4.25, to him that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that which he hath. I thought this a very, a very harsh proclamation from somebody so wise and, and, and so, you know, deep. And it wasn't until I came to the science of mind that I began to understand that this was a reference to consciousness. Because you see, to him or her that has a consciousness of plenty, of prosperity, of being in the employment of God, to that person more is given because the consciousness of abundance and thriving attracts more of itself to itself. And those that have a consciousness of ungleness, only having just enough, never being able to make ends meet, and looking at other people and thinking, boy, puss and dog now have the same look, and all of that. So those people is taking away even the little that they have because that is what is in their consciousness. And the law of attraction ensures that what you really believe about yourself and your life situation attracts more of the same. God is so good that God always says yes to your every thought. So you can't say one thing. You can't be praying for abundance and at the same time talking about how things are hard and quarreling when you go up and down the supermarket as that everything has gone up since last month. Because the two things cancel out each other and you're left with ongle, ongleness. <laughs> the Old Testament story of the widow who went to the prophet Elisha in distress, it's in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, beautifully illustrates the principle of ongleness. She had been left destitute by the death of her husband, so she was unable to pay her creditors. Under Talmudic law, she would have to forfeit her two beloved sons to work as slaves for her creditors until the debt was repaid. I can just hear her anguished cry to Elijah, help me please, my husband is dead and the creditors are coming to take my sons. I know some of you mothers wouldn't mind, but really it's your picnic and you have to, you have to stick with it. <laughs> now, Elijah asked, what have you in the house? What have you in your house? And my friends, here comes the ongleness. Loud and clear. Do you remember what she said? I have only one pot of oil. In my garden, I have a big Spanish jar, you know, those big earthenware jars. And I think that's what they, they kept the olive oil in. So she had a huge pot of oil. But she saw it as ungle. Now, some people will see that as it was intended to be seen as an indication of God's abundance. That's an indication of God's substance. You know? So, so, but she, like many people, think, I only have this. And therefore, they attract more of the same. So what did Elisha tell her to do? He said, go to your neighbors, borrow as many containers as you can, and begin to pour. So she did. In faith, I, I applaud her faith. And as long as she poured, the oil kept pouring. The oil kept coming. So my friends, when there were no more vessels, the oil ceased flowing. And this is a very important story, you know, because it's a wonderful lesson on the ability of the universe to supply all that we are able to conceive. And it underscores the truth that God can only give you as much as you have the consciousness to receive. In her book, Lessons in Truth, Emile Caddy points, uh, puts it this way, and I quote, one of the unerring truths in the universe is that there is already provided a lavish abundance for every human want. Another truth is the demand must be made before the supply can come forth to fill it. What Caddy was underscoring is we must provide the vessels in which the oil may be increased. There is no point in asking the universe for abundance if you are tight-fisted. You don't even have to, if you're like this, hanging on to what you have, you can't even open your hand to receive. 
So, as we say in Jamaica, if you pinch a Kobe, then you're going to have a consciousness of ongleness, and the universe can ongle give you what you have a consciousness of. Jesus told us to ask, and it shall be given. And somehow, you know, that word ask has been misinterpreted by traditional Christian teaching to mean get down on your knees and beg and plead and beseech. Do God, do. You know, see me, you don't see my situation. But friends, the word ask, as Jesus uses it, comes from a Greek root which meant to claim or demand. To ask is to claim or demand. It did not mean supplication to a capricious deity who may or may not respond. As Butterworth put it, you ask for water from the faucet by doing what? Turning on the tap. And you ask for light from the lamp by doing what? Flicking the switch. So there's no begging or beseeching. If you know that the water is there, you turn on the tap. If you know that the light is there, you flick a switch. You don't even have to understand how electricity works or how water gets from a reservoir to your, uh, uh, to your pipe. Just flick the switch or turn the tap. Jesus then couldn't have meant that we should petition or beg God because he assures us in Luke 12, 32, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Not a piece of it, you know. The whole kingdom belongs to you. So it is obvious that the master teacher is saying, asking means that we should claim our entitlement by cultivating a consciousness of receptivity to our good. Cultivating a consciousness of receptivity to what is already ours as sons and daughters of the richest supply that that is imaginable to human consciousness. Here are three ways I want you to contemplate that you can raise your consciousness of receptivity. First of all, bless money whenever you handle it. Not just when we ask you to bless your love offering on a Sunday morning, but every time you take out your credit card or debit card or write a check or, or pay a bill or purchase, to purchase something, bless it. Just silently affirm, God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. Second, develop the habit of regular, consistent, and conscious giving to where you are spiritually fed. And I sincerely hope that that is this church, this center for spiritual living. Many people find that the ancient spiritual practice of tithing on a regular and consistent basis blesses them with the unceasing circulation of money through their affairs. Tithing, then, is the practice of giving to your spiritual home 10% of all money that comes to you. I have never encountered a regular tither in all my years of counseling who had a cash flow issue. It requires discipline, though. You see, when you receive $1,000 and you have obligations at that moment that total $1,500, you think, how am I going to tithe $100 when I'm already short? But, friends, it is one of the unexpected unexplained mysteries of universal law that somehow having tithed all of your financial obligations are met. I can't explain to you how it works but it is a, it is a spiritual principle and this is a practice well worth your uh, participating in. A refinement of tithing which a lot of people don't know is that having received the thousand dollars and having tithed a hundred also put aside a tenth of the remaining 900 in an account which you designate to your personal prosperity. Don't put away money for a rainy day or I put away, my mother used to have burial money. No. Put away money in an account that is, I can have what I want. My, my I can have what I want account or my prosperity account. A lot of times we fail to tithe to ourselves, even when we tithe to our source of spiritual, spiritual inspiration. Give yourself because what? You are also God in expression. So if you're giving to the source, you need to also give to yourself. So it's an interesting spiritual twist and, uh, to the principle of tithing. I have two friends who, who uh, shared with me a joke that they put money um, into a ski account. I said, but I don't ski. They say, yes, spend kids' inheritance. <laughs> so... Whatever you designate it, designate it something which is 
for your, your enjoyment and your, your self-actualization and your own fulfillment. And begin today, my friends, to see yourself as a distributing center of God's good. See striving to get money just to pay bills and begin to think of it as being in perfect circulation in your life. A lot of times when people speak to me about their, their cash flow issues, they are praying to get. Well, if you're breathing and don't breathe out, what's going to happen? So think about yourself as a point in the circulation of God's good. So you see, instead of grumbling when you have to pay the light bill and the utility bills, do it with a sense of joy and fulfillment. Because what you are doing is you are, you are keeping the circulation moving. When I draw my electricity bill, I say, wow, I wonder how many children's school fees this is going towards paying, how many tables this is going to put food on. Um, I'm part of the amazing, ceaseless, mystical circulation of God's good and God's substance throughout all of creation. So if you want to have a sense of well-being and a sense of thriving, the other thing to do is to pay your bills on time. Don't put it off. As soon as you get your bill, pay it. You know, throughout history, the spiritually enlightened have, Lincoln'd, have likened prosperity to righteousness. But you see the admonition to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness was not referring to the ostentatious piety of, of the Pharisees, but rather it meant that we should cultivate the right use of divine law in our personal and business dealings. It is a call for each of us to stand firmly on the prosperity principle of the omnipresence of the universal substance because the kingdom of God truly is at hand. Haggai's response to the problem of the economy in Haggai chapter 1 verse 8 was to go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Now this, whenever you read in the Bible about going up to the hills, it means lifting your consciousness to a higher level. And of course, building a house has to do with the building of consciousness. So he went up to the hill in his consciousness, the hill of higher thinking, the thinking of his divine self, and then brought forth the substance to build a consciousness of prosperity, which is invincible and unaffected by the vagaries of, of human e economics and um, the World Bank or whatever. Work on your consciousness. That's what we're here to do, to go up the hill, not on three legs and coming down on four like my good friend on the plane, but to go up in prayer, to become still on a regular basis, my friends, to, to practice. Don't leave home in the morning without setting your intention for the day, an intention to be a blessing to everyone you meet, an intention to be part of the, the, the amazing mystical circulation of God's good, an intention to attract to you all that is necessary for the fulfillment of all that your hearts desire. And I want you to know if you have never, oh, you thought I was going to forget you, forget your assignment? <laughs> you, sh you, sh you should be so lucky. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it. And by the way, last week at the master class, we screamed with laughter because uh, <laughs> our facilitator gave us an assignment in his Sunday morning talk, and he said the same thing. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it. And, he thought we were all laughing because it's, it's, it comes from um, Mission Impossible. So I explained to him after they were laughing because I use that phrase most Sundays when I speak. So your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is this week to ponder Elisha's question to the widow with regard to yourself. What do you have in your house? Now your house is your consciousness, as I've explained, so the question is, what do you have in your consciousness regarding your prosperity? Spend some quiet time pondering this question and then jot down in your journal what you really believe about prosperity. Secondly, if you have never tried the spiritual practice of tithing, or if your tithing has been sporadic, try the practice for the last quarter of this year and be especially mindful of any upturn in your financial condition. Look out for unexpected income as well as gifts of cash and kind that increase your sense of well-being and note it with gratitude in your journal. Uh, a worthwhile exercise to undertake? Yes. Oh, good. 
Let us affirm together, I work for God and God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. I work for God and God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. Friends, we all work for God. God is our CEO and paymaster, and prosperity is our divine right. And that is the humble truth. Namaste.